Hi, everybody. Tony Marcolini. Welcome to the podcast. It may interest you to know. So I have a really special guest today, and I'm very excited to introduce her. Uh, singer, songwriter, uh, actress as well, Rosalind Kine. Welcome. Uh, it's so funny. It's a, a songwriter. I've only written one song, but you never know what's in the future. <laughs> The one song that got really, really I mean, popular. I'm humble. I don't want to say, well, I can't claim you. <laughs> There's so many people that really write on a regular basis. Well, I think to successfully do anything, you know, it makes you, you know, qualify for the adjective, I think. Okay, uh, that, yeah, that's good. Yeah, because at least you did it once, right, so far. <laughs> Well, I want to get I, I want to get to as many of your your things as I can today, and of course you've had you know this illustrious career. So I mean I can only get to so many things in a short period of time, but mm-hmm. I would like to get to as as many as I can. Uh, if if I could take you back, and this is going to maybe be a blast from the past, but you actually appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show. I made my debut, my national worldwide debut on Ed Sullivan. Yes. Now, I mean, that's an iconic uh, show that, I mean, that lives on till today and is, is thought of, you know, in such a, an amazing light. What was that like? I mean, we, I'm sure you were a nervous wreck, I would think, but what was I it was. like to, to be on the Ed Sullivan show? <laughs> no, I, w- I was a nervous wreck. And it turned out that we had the worst blizzard of I don't know how many years when I had to be at the studio that day of the taping, people were stuck in the subways. They couldn't get home. <laughs> it was a blizzard. And I had to walk with the umbrella boy to the Ed Sullivan Theater from where our apartment was on 57th Street. And that was a heck of a thing. But, you know, start of the day, made your cheeks rosy, whatever. But you, you, had, you got a little defrost once you got inside, but it just added a little more tension to the situation. <laughs> And what was it like? Can you remember the the moments before stepping onto the stage? I I do. I, I right now I'm even seeing in my mind's eye my the makeup guy doing my makeup and the hair, and uh, I was a different person because I was just out of high school and uh, uh, it was it was you know kind of mind boggling and I came off an arbitration where. Um, my then agent had made a deal for me to make my debut on Hollywood Palace. And my manager and I had met with Ed Sullivan. That's what we wanted to do. So there was a controversy. So we had to have an arbitration. Here I was out of school. I said, oh my God, they're fighting over me. It's like, (laughs) it was very, (laughs) Um, but um, Ed Sullivan won out, but Hollywood Palace wouldn't put me on after that because they wanted the debut. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that that was a, uh, had to have been an amazing way to launch your career. I mean, since then, you've been on a stage, of course, uh, I, I guess thousands of times. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've done a great deal of Broadway and off Broadway. Uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big not, Broadway. Not a, great, not a great deal, but I've done, I've done some, I wouldn't say it's a great deal. I've done, you know, Broadway, I've done, you know, a cabaret, I've done concert venues. Um, and I love to act. I mean, I would love a TV series. I've always been after this, that that TV series, you know. Well, the first time I, I ever became acquainted with you was on The Nanny. Ah, uh, which still gets shown. That episode gets shown all the time. <laughs> and that's the first time I ever saw you. And you have a beautiful voice. Uh, and and, and the, that episode was hysterical. Uh, <laughs> what was that like? That was a great show. It was fun working with everybody on, on that show, The Nanny. I mean, Fran was a doll. Uh, the director, everybody. It was just a, it was a great set. You know, it was a great fun set. And that's all you can hope for, to have nice people and a great fun surrounding when you're doing something, you know, that you, that you love, but you're the guest. So you want to have fun and you, you, want, you don't want difficulties. And they were, they were incredible people. Incredible. I'm curious, you, you, you actually perform one of your songs uh, in, at the piano, you know, in the, in the I guess this is what is the living room there. Um, did you sing that live or was that pre-recorded? Yeah. No, I sang it live. Michael played it on the piano there. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> was that a one take of the song or did you well, do it? The, the, you know, they set lighting and stuff like that. So uh, I don't remember if it was one or two takes. It wasn't a lot of takes, but I would have liked yeah. a lot more takes in a lot more areas. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. I mean, it's, it's funny because you're, 
I mean, for those who don't know, I'm sure most people do. Your sister is Barbara Streisand, and uh, sand, this is sand like sand on a beach. <laughs> Try sand. Try sand. <laughs> and we'll get it wrong. Don't worry. I apologize. I stay corrected. <laughs> <laughs> and at some point, the nanny hears you singing, and of course, your your voice sounds similar. And of course, she runs, you know, and and right. throws herself at your feet. You I mean, it's very funny. Had to go around. <laughs> It was a very funny episode. Classic. Classic television. Yeah. And the way they announced it during the week when they the teaser, you thought it was going to be my sister. That was what's so funny. Because oh, you really? always about the back. It was like a back shot. So the teaser the previous week, you know, leading to the episode, you could think it was my sister that was going to be mine. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. She was kind of obsessed with your sister on the show. I, I think that was like the ongoing thing for the character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Well, you've actually performed with your sister on tour recently. I think you're doing, you did a duet with her. You were featured yeah. and you did. What was that like to have that moment creatively as sisters? I mean, at the end of the day, you're still sisters. I mean, I, yeah. don't know. I mean, off stage, we were like going to eat and we were shopping and we were going to museums, you know, we're visiting places and, and, you know, having bites and snacks and, yeah, you know, we were family out, outside too. You know, it was fun. That's what made it fun to be with your family when you're on a tour. Um, it was incredible. I, um, I always wanted to be on stage with my sister because as a little girl, we used to sing together. She, she kind of uh, taught me how to harmonize. I'm not great at it. You know, really, I really like the lead line. <laughs> but um, but uh, we sang as kids, you know. so. Um, it was, you know, all my life, but I realized and I knew I wouldn't want to be handed anything. And I knew I had to reach a certain plateau on my own before that could happen. And uh, it happened in 2012 and 2013 when we were on tour. And uh, it was lovely because all these venues that people knew of me. So when she said, my, I'm going to do this with my sister, I did it. With, you know, they all like started Yay! And when I walked out, Roslyn, <laughs> like twenty thousand people, because I work smaller rooms. You know what I mean? And uh, <laughs> I have worked more intimate rooms, but I love the big stage. Let it not go away. I love the big stage. It was incredible. It was wonderful singing with my sister. At one point at the Hollywood Bowl, we even talked about our mother. We played one of her recordings when we were kids, and um, and how she always wanted to sing, but. Um, no, it was, it was great. It was great. Creatively, yeah. what was that like? I mean, because you're both creative people, right? Mm -hmm. And you're putting into a set, you know, it's one thing to be sisters, and, and but then like to be put into such a professionally creative situation. Did you feed off each other's energy? Did you, you know, I thought I fed like? off me. I thought I fed off my sister's energy, but I also have a different kind of energy. We have two different energies. We're, we're different. But, you know, and I'm, I'm the kind that's a little less, I'll go. Like, you know, <laughs> I move more. I like to so, so cold that you'll look at me. It's like, but we, you know, well, that's what's so great. You know, we're that people would like to find all the similarities. You know, but no, I, I worked off her energy, and it was her show. We were doing her songs, so you know, I basically, um, I was just thrilled to be there with her on that stage, and. Uh, and when I'm on my stage by myself, I do my thing, you know, but it was great to, to have that with my sister. I hope I would love to have it again. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure it will happen again. Yeah. I've read very good things and in, in reviews and, and the like about, uh, about the, the, the tour and about your collaboration. So uh, I'm confident something will be in the works, you know, again. Yeah, you, never know. you never say never, right? Never say never. <laughs> I learned that long ago. <laughs> um, so you've, you've also, and I was a little surprised to see you had done the Howard Stern show. Oh my God. Yeah. I, I, I came out. Um, what year was that? Was that 93? Um, I had just done Broadway at the Helen Hayes theater um, from, from Brooklyn and that closed. It didn't last. I went home. And then I came back to New York for a few months. I uh, had some nightclub gigs. So uh, one was at the Supper Club in Manhattan. And to, to promote it, one of the things we did was the Howard Stern Show. <laughs> and I would be listening, Michael and I, my musical director, would be listening 
to the show, the previous shows, the days that I got said, my God, how the heck am I going to handle this guy? <laughs> He's so insulting his mother, his wife. It's like, it's like oh my word. But it, it gave me an insight into him. And so I handled it. You know, I hit him. I, <laughs> <laughs> I had I, I tried to find it, you know, I, I would really think I would have enjoyed the episode. So I didn't, I didn't get a chance to watch it ahead of time. I did it three times. After that first one, I did it two more times. But wow. uh, yeah, he always tries to get your goat, you know, whatever he's put all of the, the myths and all this kind of stuff. But I nailed him. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I mean, speaking iconic, there's two things actually let me follow up on the one first you just said when you you know you had just done the broad broadway i i have to ask because it's something i'll never know right what's the experience like or could you capture it in words of when you're about to walk out on a broadway stage for the first time in your career what is that like um well you know i always depend on an overture I, an overture gets me going you know, I love the overture. Even as a kid in the audience, it was the overture. And, and if I go into a movie, it's that spectacular music on a biblical film or something, you know, one of those incredible films, the, the, uh, the majesty yeah. of the music. And it gets you all revved up and excited. So I'll be backstage, I'm going, you know, like, and then the lights go down, whatever, and you go out, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what's going through your mind? If, if you know, are, are you are you just lost in? Are you in the moment? Uh, you know, going through your lines or that that, that character, or are you, you like you, you, is the grocery list going through your list? Like, oh, I, it's, it's, it's a whole know. it's a whole bunch of stuff. It's a whole bunch of things and emotions that go through your head. And it depends, you know, even the kind of day you had could get in the way. You know, I've, you have to learn that the show must go on no matter what else is on the outside. That you've got to drop it. And you've got to entertain. And, you know, and my thing is, I love touching people's hearts. So I love communicating with my audiences. Well, instead, if it's a theater piece, so I'm communicating with other people on stage. Although with Three from Brooklyn, it was really almost like a concert slash because it was about people who were working clubs and concerts and stuff, you know, that came together or whatever. Um, but I... I I'm in the moment, especially with the songs, you know, but, and I relate to them in the way they relate to me so that I can sing from my heart. I love you know? that. And if I can't sing from my heart, if somebody can give me a song, I say, sorry, I don't care if it's a hit. I don't feel it. I wish I did, but I don't because I have to be an honest performer. I have to be the real me to share who I am because in my, when I found out who I, what I was here for, by being regressed in 1984, it made so much sense to me. And I had to, I had to follow, I had to honor that. And that was about come bringing the world together, healing with my music. You know, and lyrics like, you know, we've been come bringing the country together, bringing people together, bring, when I was a little kid and I didn't still understand that little kid, I was 18 in the nightclub in San Francisco. And I sang When I Fall in Love. And this couple came up to me left after and thanked me because the guy proposed to his girlfriend. Wow. And so, you know, it's like kind of magical in a way, isn't it? That you can have a positive, instead of all the negative that's out there today, a positive reality going on to bring the positives back into life, the love, the sharing of good, you know? Oh, I agree. That beautifully said. Uh, I think music really ties people to an emotion unlike you know nothing unlike anything else I can think of uh I can still hear certain songs uh mm -hmm. and it brings me to you know some event in my life sometimes positive and sometimes not so positive uh but you know still uh, it just just a few bars and, and and I'm there in that moment again it really it's it's almost as if it freezes a moment for you and keeps it forever in in the song okay. so and certain things the minute they come on it just get they get you you know, it's like a great ballad, a great story song gets me. But then I like the moving stuff too, because then you start to move, you move with it, you know? It's, a, it, it's so, music is colorful. It brings so many colors from the spectrum in notes. Yeah. You know, so some people say, my God, you don't do enough up tempos. Well, I do up tempos, but I am, my specialty is the ballad with all the heartfelt lyrics. <laughs> The storytelling. I like to, you know, create a play in three acts. 
you know, even if it's a medley, I'll put it together so it makes sense, the two songs about a relationship or about whatever. But I, lyrics are important to me. They cannot be dropped. But they have to come from here. If they don't come from here, it's mechanical. Right. Yeah. You know? Talk to me about that. What does the creative process look like for you? Because, I mean, I've interviewed authors who, you know, who will tell me, uh, before I can start writing a book, I, you know, I need to go out for a jog, have a cup of coffee, like I have a ritual, uh, you know, or I can only write, I can't use an outline, I can only write, like, with my fingers at the computer and, and, and the characters just tell me what to do. But, but your creativity, I mean, it's a little bit different, you know, than let's say the, the author who sits behind the computer, but do you have a process? I mean, you're just in the shower and it comes to you like how? Well, um, sometimes it may come to me in the shower. <laughs> I really like to work with others. I'm not like a lone worker. I like the creative process with others. Um, Light of Love, I wrote with two other people, Michael Orland and Judy Quay and I did the lyrics. It was my first number. We had fun writing. It took us forever. We would send out for Chinese food. We would get the fortune cookies. One time they came back with all the same fortune. We called up and sent them. What do you mean? We want another bag of fortune cookies. What is this? <laughs> you know? Now that's but, a new story. No one would believe. I, I like know, that. But it was true. It was like we kept on putting <laughs> mass produced fortune. <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and you have to love who you're working with. I, I, I don't think I could work with somebody I didn't like, or I, or I didn't feel their heart or their honesty or their integrity. You know, I turn off when I don't feel warmth, when I don't feel empathy and compassion. So um, you create from your gut. Yeah. Yeah. Even a song, it's, it's, it's got to take me. You know, that's what I, I always also loved about Shirley Bassey because she sang mm -hmm. from her kishkas, the guts, and I get some of my emotion, my dramatic moments, I learned from her. I picked up her, I'm not her, but in my way, right. I do that same, like just taking that lyric and going like this to get every meaning, nuance out of it. Amazing. Because that's where I'm feeling, it's like to just say a word, you're saying a word, it's like if somebody gave you a rub down instead of a massage. A massage feels really like you're really getting in, the lyrics have to do the same thing. Wow. Story. Your passion is compelling. Oh, thank you. I love that. <laughs> so to talk to me about Saturday Night Live, right? If you if you come from New York in particular, I mean, it's, an, it's again, there's an iconic show, but also, yeah. I mean, anybody who's from New York, I mean, that's the pinnacle, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, especially when it was in the beginning, it was still a pinnacle today, but the original cast, the original, and I, the reason I got on there was because my brother-in-law, Elliot Gould, was hosting, and I, he brought me on. I mean, you know, it's like... Um, yeah. He yeah. Well, so what was it like to be on Saturday Night Live? <laughs> it was, it was again, scary, you know, but there were, other, there were two other musical acts on the same show with me, Leon Redbone and the McGarrigal sisters. And I just did a ballad called I'm Not Anyone, which was written by Paul Anka, but uh, it was performed by Sammy Davis Jr. on his album. And I loved it because it had a lot of the emotions. It's like, you know, and probably would be very good to put out today for people who don't feel like they're worthy because you should know you're worthy. I agree. You know, but I, again, so and when I get into that lyric, it's like, I'll not be you, Miss Lady. I mean, it's like you have, you come, you know, and I do the same thing with songs about the world, but I love that meat. I love, I love that. Wow. You know, with, with me, even when I exercise, it's all or nothing at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you, if you're not unconscious by the time you're done, it wasn't worthwhile. <laughs> well, I mean, like I would work, I go to the gym, not lately in the last two and a half years, but I would work out for two hours. My, my physician would say, why are you working out for two hours? I said, because I got to keep number one. It helps your breathing. It helps, you know, and I want to stay thin and I want to, you know. I feel better when I work out and I, and I push more weights. Well, you got a back little thing now well, because I was pushing more. <laughs> I really, I once taught exercise too. I once taught aerobics. So wow. I, it was a good thing because it was selfish for me. I worked out harder because you had to be the one that shows the women in the class <clears throat> what to do. Don't just like flap your arms, you know? 
it has the guts. It's just, you know, it's almost the same thing in everything I do. It's, you know, I either like I'm, I'm lackadaisical about something or I am so committed. Well, it sounds that way. It sounds like that which you are passionate about, mm -hmm. you really, you, you know, you take your pitch and swing. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Very, very cool. <laughs> I like that. I like people feel passionate about what they do because so many times, and it doesn't matter to me what you do. I mean, you could be anything, but if you're happy doing it, embrace it, you know, enjoy it and be the best exactly. at that you can be. Yeah. I mean, when people say, well, I'm, I don't, I'm not a star or I'm not this, I'm not a big star either. To tell you the truth, I'm not. My sister is an icon legend. She's in her own realm. You know, people used to say to me, what does it feel like? Are you guys, is there jealousy? I said, no, my sister is, is this incredible talent. And I came nine years later. I would call myself a close second, but I'm not her. I'm not her. <laughs> does she and still, does she watch her? And, and, and we're very different. Our personalities are somewhat di you know, different. So uh, it's, it's good. You can't always be, you can't be twins. Who wants to be a twin? And, you know, I've always tried my best never to, get work or whatever on her coke tips. Well, now tell me, did she, like every other sibling relationship, you were much younger. Did she yeah. boss you around? <laughs> well, when I was a little girl, she, you know, she was, if I was watching cartoons too loud in the living room, what'd you trap down? <laughs> because growing up, um, my brother, we had two bedrooms when I was born. This was after when my mother married my father. Um, it was just before I was born and there was a two bedroom apartment in Brooklyn and my brother got the bedroom and my sister and I, well, I was in the crib, but once I was old enough, she and I shared the sofa for long, but I loved it because she used to tickle my back with the long nails to get, me. I couldn't fall asleep. I had a sister-in-law that had to tickle my back to get me to go to sleep and then that killed it for everybody. <laughs> but it was a way I really relaxed, you know, um, but uh, yeah, she, so you were the she, baby. I mean, I so was the baby. So when my brother left, she got the bedroom. My parents separated. My sister got the bedroom, and you know, I'm in the living room on the sofa, and uh, and sometimes I was watching. You know, a kid, you watch your cartoons on Saturday, and she may have been out late or whatever. But um, we used to. I mean, I used to love to be. You know, we we go to the beach when she worked at a Chinese restaurant. Our neighbors. She had babysat for the kids, who I'm still in touch with today. And I think she is as well. And uh, they had a restaurant. My sister went from babysitting to being the cashier at the restaurant. So sometimes I would go with her and give the lollipops out to the kids while their parents were paying the check. And then we would have our own feast after everybody left. <sighs> wow, those are some really nice memories. I mean, you, I think you guys grew up in New York, right? In Brooklyn. Brooklyn. I'm from Brooklyn as well. <laughs> are you where? What were you with? Bensonhurst. Uh, we had relatives in Bensonhurst. We were from Flatbush. At least oh, yeah. they were uh, Pulaski Street before I was born. They were in, in different areas. But when I was born, we were uh, in East Flatbush. And um, 3102 Newkirk Avenue was like called the Vandevere Estates. There were like multiple buildings, the same apartments, six apartments on a floor, six stories. <laughs> and it was humongous community. But I had one... My first, uh, well, first, my first school was a yeshiva, so I was bused. They had to pick me up by bus. But after that, I went to public school 269. That was across the street on one side. And I finished seventh and eighth grade at the other PS89 on the other side. And then I went to Erasmus. And then we moved to Manhattan. So I went to private school. And I, really, I didn't love it because it was so progressive. And I was not used to that, um, the progressiveness. And so the following year, I went back to Julia Richmond High School in Manhattan. And that's, I graduated from the country school. Yeah, I'm still, I still go back to Brooklyn. I'm now in New Jersey now, but I still yeah. go back to my dentist, Dr. Ferriola. Yay, she's, in, <laughs> she's still in Bensonhurst. I still travel there. Really? <laughs> yeah, somebody said to me the other day, why do you go to Brooklyn to go to the dentist? I say, well, I, 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 I couldn't imagine any other way. I've been going there since I was born. <laughs> you find somebody you like or you trust. You stick with it. That's only, right. <laughs> only when you don't trust or don't like that you look to be to change. Right? right? I find it difficult. I wouldn't like to look. I would tell, tell me I have to change my doctors. No. I pick these people because I like them. I trust right. them. And no matter where you go, you go back to them, right? Yeah, I don't know any other way. That's... Yeah. <laughs>
Exactly. Okay. So now you're in, you're, you're coming from Brooklyn and, and New York. Uh, and you'd say that, uh, you probably because you were the baby sister and you were a little bit further in age she you didn't have that combative uh relationship too much though no, uh, you know I, I'm, I, I, I was closer in age they pick on you yeah and uh and as a matter of fact my sister had another friend who's also her name was also barbara and she had a sister like me they both had a different father and i became friends with the sister and my sister you know we'd all go to the beach and we'd all you know Oh, wonderful. Memory. I love hanging with my sister. I miss her when she left home. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I lost my sister to show business. <laughs> oh. Well, I mean, unfortunately, yeah. it's unfortunate for you, you know, but uh, fortunate for everybody else because, as you say, you know, she's, she's, she had to go after her dream. Legend. Sure. sure. And then, then eventually we got to Manhattan anyway. So, you know, <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I always loved, I always looked up to my sister. So now let's talk about songwriting. And my brother, my older brother, too. Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. Was What's your brother in the that? entertainment industry? No, 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 no. He was a commercial artist. He went to Pratt Institute. Oh, nice. He built up a, an advertising agency, and then he got out of that and went into mega real estate. Now he's retired. Very he nice. He had a birthday on Friday. I'm, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be, I'm going, I'm taking my first trip since the pandemic to see my family on the East Coast and my brother, because he just had a birthday and I haven't seen him in two and a half years. And whenever I work his area, I never come home without visiting him. Oh, well, it's good that you guys are all still so close. I, I mean, that, that's not true of many families, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. you know, every family has their ups and downs. Every family has their arguments. Every family has their disappointments. You know, it's like if all of us were psychologists, we would handle people differently, you know, and we'd have more understanding. I, I, I think because I had, I grew up in a broken home, my parents, and I went through such horrible stuff when my parents would confront each other or whatever. I said, this is not what I want in my life. I didn't, you know, I, 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 I want harmony. So I strive for harmony. I don't like when people, because sometimes even press can cause problems and this, that, and the other. I don't like disharmony. I don't like misinformation. And I don't like, you know, and I, I, I'm a harmonic person. You know, I just, that's how we all need to be. We ought to be loving each other, accepting and wrapping each other around for our differences and trying to understand each other and appreciating the cultural differences and sharing what we are very much alike also. But, you know, encompass everything. I couldn't agree more. You know? I think if people, uh, you know, could listen more uh, th than they'd speak. Well, probably, I think that would today, be. Unfortunately, some of them are listening to the wrong people. Yeah. yeah That's a true story, though. But... Another story, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, no, I do agree with you. I, I think that we should try to embrace our differences. Uh, and harmony is a great word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I like up in Brooklyn, it was such a melting pot. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> a melting, pot, a melting pot. pot. You know? And so. you, you didn't think anything. Uh, you, nobody, nobody gave it a thought. Like if somebody yeah. was, you know, s screaming out the window. I mean, nobody really oh, no, thought it anything. You know that your neighbors would hang out the window and watch all well, you kids. If your mother wasn't home, they would sit out there. In the summer, they would come and sit around in a circle at night to cool off because we didn't have air conditioning and they would watch over you, you know? It was like, hello, Charlie. <laughs> everybody knew everybody's business. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> for certain. <laughs> but to a certain extent, there was a lot more harmony. I mean, yeah. and I think people came together uh, mm -hmm. a lot easier uh, than, than I sometimes see today. Uh, yeah. That's unfortunate. It is unfortunate because, you know, it's like there, we, we came from immigrants. We all came, you know, my, they emigrated from Russian Ukraine, Belarus, in the turn of the century. We're all, just because they're coming in now, doesn't make it a different situation. We all, you know, have to be accepted. I mean, it's just, you shouldn't be giving people hard times unless somebody is really a criminal or really this, or, you know, you have to watch out. But if somebody's a good person, they want to work and they'd have, you know, this and that, or, or they're a refugee running from something, you've got to be understanding. You've got to see what you can do to help. My mother was always, 
always collecting for charity. She always believed in what we call tzedakah. And, you know, like, like, I've never heard that before. Tzedakah is like giving, you know, giving of self. It's a charity. She used to have a little charity box that she would fill it up and then turn it into the charity or whatever. But she was always a big believer in that you, you help others, you, you give. It, it, it My mother never had a lot, but she always gave. <clears throat> and we all got that from her. We oh, all got yeah. that from her. That's beautiful. Uh, before we won't wind up crying, I'm going to take you back <laughs> to the business. <laughs> uh, so you, you wrote, uh, you, you said one particular song, right? Light, Light of Love is the, is the title for it. You, so yeah. you co-wrote it. Um, and how did, can you tell me the story behind, you know, how that song came about? I mean, I think it's the song you actually sang on the nanny it is, uh, yeah. and has recently been re-released if I'm not mistaken. Well, it was never released when I did it on the, the nanny. It had not been released yet. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. I thought it was. No, I was never, I never had a big arrangement. Every so often I did it in the sh in my show with just piano or the trio, but this is a fully produced rendition with a video that hopefully <laughs> depicts coming together, learning that your value is, va your worth is valuable. Your contribution is valuable. And to learn to love yourself and share that with others. If you love yourself, you're able to share that with others. I think sometimes when people don't love themselves is when they get too much judgmental uh, of other people, you know? And sometimes, you know, you, uh, you project how you're feeling onto another person and they didn't deserve it. Agreed. Wow. Yeah, agreed. Um, yeah, they, I mean, I want to put a link, by the way. Anyone who has not uh, heard or, or uh, watched the video, I mean, it's, wow, it's amazing. It's definitely worthwhile. I'm going to put a link uh, for you. Thank Make you. Make it easy. I'm working uh, one right now that's in my show. That's my 11 o'clock number. Um, really? It was in the can. We finished it in 2019 or 18, but I took, I was trying to put a whole album together before I released anything. So now you need a video every time you put something out. And we had the pandemic and I hadn't been in the studio, you know, so it's been sitting there, but I'm working via Zoom with my, my producer, we do working on the video for that so we can finally get it out. <laughs> now, is this a song that you've written as well? Is this another no, song? No, this, no, this particular medley is a Jerry Herman medley. From, oh. It only takes a moment, which is from um, Hello, Dolly. Yeah, into, yeah. Um, Kiss Her Now from The American Girl. And it's an acting piece. I mean, it is. Do you pick your own music and the what you perform, or do you have a team that does that? I, for you? Team. I yeah, I, I I I'm a team worker. I don't have you know. I don't like I don't like to work alone. I mean, on stage I can be on stage and perform, but I mean, I love my musicians to be happy and involved and getting a joke if they get it and laughing, and I talk to them like I talk to the audience. It's all about enjoying yourself. Yeah. You know, and that also gets you out of whatever nervousness you have. You know, the, the first you walk out with a big hello and a big smile, you know, you get the people in the right mood. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know? I, I, I didn't get, give you a chance to, to tell me the story. I, I think I took us off. It was a time in my life in the early 80s after I'd been married and I was separated. I had not been divorced yet. Um, going through a lot of turmoil, like, you know, I've always felt my life was up, down, this way, that way. I never really, you know, I, rem I remember that somebody once wrote about me when I first started out, that, you know, with my sister for my sister. It seems that to get any attention, she would have to jump off the, the, um, jump off the Eiffel Tower singing the burning of Rome. <laughs> I mean, to get any attention, you know, it's like, I it's really... <laughs> And, and yet, I, and I turned down work where they wanted me at the Olympia in Paris when I was just starting out. And I, and I said, I'm not ready for that. See, that would be because it's who I am, who I'm related to. I was not ready to do that. But I did go to France and do a special with Charles Osnabour. Oh. <laughs> but, but the other one, I was not ready for. Now that I'm ready, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> so I think you have your ups, your downs, your ins, your outs. Um, I just have a talent I want to share and I want to help heal. 
So this song came out, the idea for this song and where it came was when I was regressed because I was soul searching. And while I was traveling and singing, I was reading books about psychic phenomena, life after death, um, you know, the choices your soul makes and all that. And uh, I really believe it. I feel, that's to me what makes sense. Being here one time around just doesn't make sense to me. What is the point, you know? Um, and so your soul moves on. I think it either comes back to learn lessons it needs to didn't learn this time, or it goes on maybe to a higher plane somewhere. I'm really, I'm into that. You know, I'm into crystals. I'm into uh, meditating. I'm into psychic phenomena. And I used to discuss it with my rabbi. I used to, you know, certain things. Um, I, you know, so I, it was during this time with all of this research that I um, was introduced or told about this lady who was uh, regressing people. And so I went and had a regression done in 1984. And I could hear myself. I wasn't totally under where it was like, you know, you're hypnotized and you don't, are not aware of what you're saying. And I, I totally went beyond the, the birth canal. I didn't even see my birth. I went to one lifetime, just one. And it was one in a place called Lemuria. It's Lemuria, which was like... Um, the West Coast Atlantis. I mean, for, I mean, I didn't know this, but it was like that time, it was that time, in that time period, where I was a man, I was in pantaloons with sandals, with a turban, I lived in a stone hut, and at this moment where I came into this place, I was, getting, I was in a duel with another man over the woman we both loved. Unfortunately, in the duel, she accidentally got killed. And I have, what came out of my regression is that I have been coming back, looking for my love over and over, all through eternity. But when I did word associations having to do with, with, that, um, with that picture, with what that was, it was all about world, harmony, peace, unity, universality, you know, love, acceptance. It was all about healing. That, that regression brought me the awareness of why I'm here. So it's not so much about my, my, my monetary or whatever success, it's, it's about what I'm, I'm meant to do while I'm here. And I, you know, I, I would love to do more. I'm in a position in my career where it's not up here, where I, but I would love to you know, do that much more. But well, when I, I, but even when I'm, even when I'm one-on-one -on -one with somebody, when we have these conversations, you can feel them hearing you, you know, touching their lives. And that means, you know, that's the world, to spread the love, to spread the understanding. And, you know, the acceptance. I mean, I'll be on the phone with a, a representative from the bank or whatever. I say, hi, sweetie, can you do this? You know, Thank you so much for your time. I mean, what does it cost you to be nice? And sometimes we strike up a conversation, they don't even want to hang up. It's just, you know, it's just being nice. Not and dismissive. Is, and is this the point where you start getting the idea for this song? Yeah. That's yeah. The, oh, then, wait, after my regression, later on in 1987, was it 87? 1987, I took part in the harmonic convergence and climbed Bell Rock at four in the morning with a friend to bring in the sun. And it was the experience of all those groups around that mountain, the harmony, bringing in the enlightenment that, that did it. Wow. That was the crowning glory. That's the spark. <laughs> That's the spark. And so you wrote it with two other people. So I assume mm -hmm. that at some point, you know, you start putting it together uh, and uh, do you play any instruments? No, I, I wish I did. I, I, I studied my, I studied the accordion for a little while. I had the little accordion when I was a kid, but when we had to go to the big one, my parents couldn't afford it. So, <laughs> so I know my every good boy does fine. It's, you know, in all the other spaces, but I, I really, and I can like finger stuff, but I'm not real. I wish I could. Then I could play for myself. <laughs> so you you wrote the lyrics primarily. Yeah, so Judy and I wrote the lyrics. Yeah. And Judy also was a very spiritual. That's why we connected. Yeah. 
the spirituality is like it's 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 beyond religion it's 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 universal tying it's the fact that, that the god self is within you and we are all part of that that universality we all come from the, the same place and that there are really to being here on life is learning lessons that bring us back to that place wow really well said beautiful Thank you. Um, so that, that now, how long did it take to write this song now after you get the, the idea? Well, depending on when, who was working and not working and whether we were all in town, it took a little while and we weren't in a rush, you know, it's like we didn't, we didn't have a date that it had to be finished by because then I did a, I did a, a demo of it, but it wasn't a great demo because I had, um, uh, it was just a rough cut, you know, at somebody's right. house or whatever. And it really wasn't cut until recently it was, it, was it exciting to finally, huh? was it exciting to finally bring it to fruition well, i was excited every moment i spent working on it and before the pandemic i was in the studio you know working on it you know with my producer now it's like generation away yeah um, but do you think you'll to... write more songs mm hmm do you think this will make you write more songs? I don't know. You know, I don't plan it. I don't plan it. You know, I have to, it's, it's got to be the right thing with the right people, you know, the right reason. I get it. The right reason. I get it. But I, you know, I, I mean, I also did, you know, a, a cover of Save the Country. And that wasn't about my singing prowess. That was about the message. And that was a heavy, heavy um, video. But nice video, too. nice, but it showed some realities in there that people have to wake up to. And some liked it, some didn't, some loved the song, but when they saw the video, <laughs> but, hey, that's my belief, I'm sorry. I really think we all need to come together and stop this, this hatred in the world and this uh, crimes and against other people. It's just horrifying. Well, it's, it's wonderful that, you know, you're, you have, I mean, you certainly have a platform, right, to express, you have a lot of fans, uh, mm -hmm. and you have the ability to, you know, to spread your message. So I, I think it's pretty magnificent that you're doing that, uh, that you're trying to spread a, po you know, message. I, I, I'm, I fully support the concept of positivity, uh, you know, positivity, creativity, tolerance. I think that. Yeah. And sometimes it's hard, you know, sometimes you go through, you're depressed, you're this, you know, you're frustrated, you're anxious. I mean, to say that I was always positive, no, but I know that that's the important message. I know when I'm, when I'm coming from that place, it makes me happy too, to share that. You know, I don't want to share the other. Sometimes I say, oh my God, this is getting me crazy. And I said, please, dear God, I don't want to feel this way, but I can't help my, you know, I want things right. And I want it right now. I want the world to be happy. I want people to like, you know, you go, well, well, bring the world to sing in perfect harmony. <laughs> Remember that Coke commercial or was that Dr. Pepper or something? That's what we need. Camaraderie. Really well said. <laughs> really well said. <laughs> so what are you working on right now? Right now I'm working on that video. And, uh, and then after that one, I have another medley that needs a video. And then I have another song about healing the world. It's, a, um, um, it's, it's called, um, oh my God. You see that? I'm, this is my, this is my, uh, my COVID brain working. <laughs> um, Harvest for the world. It's called Harvest for the world. It's a cover. Um, and that's waiting for a video too. That's finished and in the can. <laughs> And then I started, I started a song that I do in my show every so often called uh, um, We Can Be Kind. And uh, in the pandemic with the mask, I just couldn't sing with a mask on. It was drying me out and everything. So, and I can't do it without being in the studio with him recording it. So um, that's on hold, but we started it. <laughs> do you think that you'll uh, get back to at some point touring I hope again? So. I yeah. hope so. I yeah. hope so. Just, you know, my little getting my feet wet, you know, it's, it's, it's been hard. It's, I'm, I was very, very careful during the pandemic. I don't take things for granted, you know. Well, a lot of people now, they're doing even Zoom um, shows, oh, you know, they get together, yeah. they, they, they record, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. 
the Zoom shows and the podcasts. I did so many podcasts during that time. And uh, got a lot of podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of us out there. <laughs> well, I mean, I love to have conversations with creative people. I mean, I think you get to, you know, you approach the world differently than the scientific brain. So I truly enjoy just you know, being able to sit down and have a conversation. And of course, you've had unique experiences, unparalleled experiences with where you've been and, uh, you know, the, the types of th things that have occurred in your career. Uh, I mean, and I'm a fan. I think you have a beautiful voice. Uh, so, I mean. It's an interesting ride. It has its ups, its downs, its ins, its outs. Hopefully, it teaches you to be a human being and keep your feet on the ground. I remember once auditioning, um, for my, my deal with ABC Paramount. And uh, Joyce Selznick, may she rest in peace, said to me, uh, you may never have to sing in another nightclub, Rosie. I was stealing the scene from the two guys that had it all week and she's, pick it up. She's, Rosie's stealing you, the scene from you. And um, she said, you may never have to play another nightclub. I said, please, Joyce, I like my feet on the ground. <laughs> I'm Capricorn, I'm earthy. I don't want to live in the clouds except for hope and faith. My clouds are, I do believe I'm spiritual. I believe in that there's a super being up there, but I also believe in science. I, I don't think you can have, we'll have to have one or the other. They're both there. You know, there are things you can prove, things you can't. Faith is where you can't. Science is where you can prove it verbatim. But they both have a reason for being. Well, you're, in, you're, intelligent, and you're an intelligent and lovely, well-spoken woman. What a pleasure it's been to get to spend a little time with you. Thank you. Um, I mean, here. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I, I'm going to put some links in the in the at the bottom of the video for some of your material. I really encourage people to check it out, buy your music. Uh, exactly what you're talking about comes through in your performance of every song. I mean, anything I've ever heard you sing, you completely like nailed it. You bring your emotion to the song. I feel it. Um, which is one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the podcast. I, I, I think I suspected, you know, that kind of thing has to come from the inside uh, because you definitely motivate and, and, you know, you make people feel things I through. It has process. to come from here. Yeah. It has yeah. to be real to you to be able to be real to those you are sharing it with. And you get that. I mean, so often, I, I really do think that's a nuanced thing that does not occur that easily, especially not today. There seems to be a little more uh, formula to the music business. Uh, you know, somebody, they just get the song, they sing it. Uh, you know, maybe there's more notoriety to the, to the dance number that goes with it. Or, uh, But that level of, and I think this is true of, of the um, kind of the American classic songbook kind of music to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, but... I, I just think that years ago, there was a lot more feeling that went into the performance of, of, of music than there is today. And I'm, I'm really happy to learn that, you know, yeah. when you're selecting music, that's what you're doing. You're saying, what speaks to me? And right. what can, you know, what do I want to, what am I drawn to? And what can I put back out there and, and really right. feel it? And I love yeah. that. Yeah. And, uh, just saying that I think, you know, you sometimes you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to learn that you, you need to be drawn to your music and feel it before you can take it and put it back out there, uh, really connecting with it. Because I don't think anybody thinks well, about that. Today, I was going to say that the difference in music today and yesteryear. Yesteryear, the artist made the song. Now, the song makes the artist. Wow. Now I like that. I'm going to use, I'm going to, I'm going to steal that. I think instead and drop that in conversation. I'll credit you though. If, I, if that's okay. You know, in many ways, it's the song that makes the, uh, the song that makes the artist. It's the song that sells that people, you know? Yeah, but you're right. Because I can remember years ago, several artists would perform the same song. Mm -hmm. You don't really see that so much today. Uh, but you know, years ago, there would be a number of different popular artists who all perform the exact oh, same. Oh, yeah, they both covered. They would be the original and then all the covers. As a matter of fact, one year when I was working at the Fister Hotel in Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 
I opened the show or something. We did open it differently. We opened it with a ballad instead of like a, a welcome tune. It was a the summer of 42. And some guy reviewing me or some guy in the audience, I can't remember what, said, how dare she sing her sister's song? And I thought, my sister's song? <laughs> people sang that song before my sister sang it. It wasn't like people, you know? It was like, <laughs> and um, I thought that was a very interesting comment because it's like, I'm not allowed to do any song that she's done, which between her and I, that's not, should, should not be, it has nothing to do with anything. I have the right to sing whatever songs I want. You know, it's like sometimes we end up singing the same songs not knowing it. <laughs> well, it shows, I mean, something, maybe in the sister part of you, you're both attracted to the, some of the same music. Yeah. Well, you know, when I was growing up, my sisters introduced me to Mathis and Lena Horne and Sarah Vaughan. You know, so, but I also had my the Beatles and Motown, <laughs> Scylla Black, and you know, the people, London, the English invasion. That was me. <laughs> so that, that got in me. And when I started my career, I was doing more of that kind of music. The only ballads I had in my show were When I Fall in Love and a medley of Sunday songs that went from like the beginnings of like the 1940s from Sunday Kind of Love into Sunday Sweet Sunday from Flower Drum Song. And then, um, uh, what was it? Um, it was another, like a jazz song. And then it went into like contemporary songs. So it told the, the history of music with the, you know, of time with this music, the difference in music. But the only ballad I did was the Sunday Kind of Love and by itself, when I fall in love, everything else was more. I did um, Hair and Promises, Promises medley to close my show. I mean, you know, starting with Frank Mills. I met a boy called Frank Mills on September 12th, right here in front of the Waverly. But unfortunately, I lost his address. You know, he would want to see. It was like, <laughs> then I went into, oh, while the go, he's good. No, he won't tell you about him and let you reach the point of no return. Go. You know, it was like, <laughs> and then I oh, was growing less but like the sunshine. This was my, my show when I was 18 years old. Do you have a favorite artist? I mean, is there somebody that you. Oh, I love Shirley Bassey. Oh. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, love my, I love my sister. She's an icon. I mean, but I love, I've always loved Bassey. Yeah. I love her drama. I, you uh, know, I get it. I love her too. I love it. I love her when, she's a, when she used to wear the gowns with all the, the fabric. I, I, she was just so dramatic and so, and her voice, diamonds are forever. <laughs> you know. Did you ever get to meet her in your lifetime? I never have. I know my sister did. They, I think they were on a music show together, but I so am enamored by her. And in my growing up years, I mean, it was like, you know, Petula Clark and, you know, I had, I had my female from the, you know, from my early years too, that I used to buy their records. I used to buy a record a week at my local record store. And you would go in and buy a single, you know, and you'd get the new Beatles album when it came out or whatever. You know, we had all the dance shows on in the afternoon at that time when I was a kid. That's right. It was a whole other time. Tell me who is there, was there any artists that you've met in your time that you were starstruck by? I was starstruck by, well, Mathis came to see me and I was starstruck by that. I was playing the Mondrian here in Los Angeles and my friend was his sound man and he brought him to see me and he was sitting on the banquette with his feet crossed and his legs and his eyes were closed and there were a couple of drunks at another table and he almost got into a fight. <laughs> trying to get them to be quiet. I mean, I've seen him since and he's been, you know, he's come to my sister's birthday or whatever, but that was like for me, you know? Were you, now did you react like, an, uh, most people when they meet a star, you know, mm -hmm. they, they are stuttering around you, you know, I mean, they're stuttering a little bit. <laughs> a little, but so, I mean, were you the same as everybody else? Like, were you, you know, how did you react to, to, uh, to meeting somebody, you know, you? No, I mean, I'm enamored. I, you know, I grew up with a sister that became famous when I was still a kid. So it's different. Betty Davis came to see me at the Persian Room. And I remember the maitre d' telling me to make sure I introduce her because she loves to be introduced. And I did. And she, <laughs> she was kissing. 
And somebody told me that in a book that she wrote or the person that wrote with her, that she mentions coming to see Barbara Streisand's assistant version of Rosalind Kind. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it was at Christmas time in 1969 because I opened there in December 17th, 1969. So it was that during that three week period that she came to see me. Um, I, but I sat in, before that ever happened, opening a funny girl. I think she was sitting in front of my mother and I. But I, because my sister was already in the business, I, I've never gotten like that. Somebody once said to me, you don't seem that excited about your record playing on, on the radio. I said, no, I am. But I just don't, you know, I don't go crazy nuts because it, it was normalized it was normalized yeah. for you at a young yeah. age exactly exactly i have friends i always have to have a picture with us you know a star you know i i you know I, i'll take a picture with somebody that has a great heart and is known for that you know but it's, it's nice to have camaraderie amongst your peers not you know um Richard Chamberlain, when I was a little girl, I would say he could stick his uh, shoes under my bed anytime. Anyway, it turned out we shared, we had a desert AIDS function. We were dinner partners and I ran into him in West Hollywood in the market. And since then we've run into each other several times. I adore him. Such a sweetie pie. Can't believe he's how old he is. My God, we're all getting so old. Well, you don't look it, for okay. sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, this may be a very hard question for you to uh, answer. I know I'm, I'm running out of time. I really have to let you go. But if I could squeeze in another question. Um, what is your most memorable career moment? I mean, obviously, I know you have personal moments where, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about your, your personal life. But I, what's the most memorable moment you've ever had? We've talked about so many, you know, moments you've walked on stage. But what, what's the one that you'll never forget? Like, it's in here. It's always going to be there. This is a hard one for me because it's. Hard I thought it might be. Yeah. And if, it, and if you don't have a moment like that, that's fine too. If there, there's just too many. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, any one moment. Gosh. You know what? There, there, are, there are so many. It's hard to narrow I, down. I can't, yeah. Yeah, you've had so many monstrous moments. I wasn't sure you were going to be able to answer that, to be honest no. with you. I said, this is a person who's had all these incredible moments. Well, you know what? I've had monstrous moments, but I've also had lesser moments. And I just it equalizes out. You know, not everything is phenomenal. Every, there's day-to-day -day life, and there's living, and there's existing, and there's, you know, going to the grocery store, doing your laundry. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, what I was curious about is because, you know, to, to the person looking in, at your life, you would think, oh, it's got to be one of those, you know, big moments. It's got to be that step out onto the onto the Broadway stage or that step out to Ed Sullivan or that. I mean, you know, you're thinking it's got to be one of those things. And I was curious because you never really know a person and what's important to them in their head. If you were going to tell me, well, I remember once, you know, I, you know, I, 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 I you know, I sang something at this small club. And like you said to me before, and they, they came over later and they said they got engaged, you know, and that moment will always be with, I mean, I didn't know what you were going to tell me because this, there's such a variety, you know, it's a penalty to pick from. Mm -hmm. I said, but is it going to be something big or something small? But I get you have so many eclectic type memories that it's not, it's probably too hard to pick just one. It is, you know, even when I came back to New York at 54 Below, I hadn't been there. I, I mean, I played Brooklyn College and I played, but they, uh, Richard J said to me, but that's not Manhattan. I said, it's New York. What's the matter with you? <laughs> so it's like, but it was Brooklyn. So it was different. So I did theater. And then I did, you know, when, when I came to 54 Below after not being there, because I live on the West Coast. And so I wasn't really going there a lot. And um, do you miss New York? And, you know, yes and no. I really, I like more intimacy. It gets to be very bustling. When I'm in New York, I like to be, unless I'm working and I have a reason to be there. Um, it's so much hustle. It's not the New York when I grew up. It's so, to me, sometimes I'm walking down Broadway, the last time I was there, and it looks like that old movie, Metropolis. Mm. with the big building. Remember the silent movie? Yes, I do. But there's no sky anymore in Manhattan. It's just crazy. I loved it when it was a little more not so big, 
in the, on this little island. And that's so, you know, when you still had the old fat, the older restaurants, the, you know, the Hawaii Kai next to the Winter Garden, and you had the little candy store around the corner that I used to get my uh, marzipan at, you know, <laughs> I mean, and I used to walk for miles in New York. I used to walk home from high school all the way to the West Side. I mean, I, it was great growing up there. You know, Brooklyn was a great place to grow up because you had camaraderie with neighbors. It was a, you know, it was a community. And great um, pastries. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, because we had a Jewish bakery that was phenomenal for one thing, and then we had Ebinger's. Ebinger's, oh yeah. We were both on the same block. Rispoli's, Ebinger's. Oh my God, oh. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I, it's like, I love it. I love the energy, but sometimes at a place where I like a little more, a little more space. Yeah. I don't like, you know, being anxiety ridden from, you know, too many people on the street. And I'm a fast walker. So I learned years ago to dodge walking traffic <laughs> because I don't have the patience to walk slow. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but that's what New York is. It's, it's hyper. It's high end. Everything is big, you know? And somebody will say to me, God, you still have your accent after all these years. I said, it comes out when I speak fast or when I'm angry, it comes out. Not when I'm singing, not when, you know, but even in my comedy, because my timing is very, you know, New York. <laughs> very New York. And I probably didn't help, right? I, I, <laughs> York, I fight the accent as well. I, I, you know, I, it still comes out, you know, when yeah. in most instances for me, but I try as well to, yeah. <laughs> I think I've taken you, I've kept you past the amount of time a lot. Yes, time. you have. And, and I really appreciate <laughs> it. <today. laughs> I apologize for running over on you, but it was just, you're so, so delightful to talk to. And uh, I hope you'll come back again. I tell you. I hope you'll definitely come back and visit me again and talk to me as, as you're creating new things. Sure. And, yes, definitely. and I'll put all the links in for anybody who hasn't experienced her music. You're really missing out. Uh, check it out. And uh, th thank you so much. I'm going to close the podcast here thank and you. say, I was so grateful <laughs> for your time and you're, you're just you're so lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Bye everyone. Bye.